Hi everyone and welcome to the fifth edition of In the Fox's Den. Um, I've got a real music icon here today um, who, um, who changed his career. Uh, so he's going to talk about both careers. Um, you will probably know him best as uh, the original drummer of The Clash, but he's now one of our most respected chiropractors. Uh, hello, Terry Chimes. Good afternoon, sir. How have you been keeping in lockdown? Uh, I've quite enjoyed it, actually, because I've got young kids these days, so I was just playing with them the whole time, so that, that was fine, really. So it's been quite useful. Yeah, but I felt, uh, by the end, I was thinking, I've got to get a move on, do something, you know, it was a bit too inactive. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll do this, shall we? That's, that's probably a good thing to do now. So, first of all, Terry, because uh, I've known you for, for quite a while, obviously, and I had the pleasure of agenting your book but um tell everyone how you first got involved in the music business because you were quite young weren't you yeah well I, when i was at school i was one of those kids that liked you know uh, health and animals and nature and that sort of thing and then when i became a teenager i was going to become a vet i think and then as a teenager i discovered girls and i knew to get the girls you've got to be a football player or a musician i was no good at football so i didn't have much choice really so when i left school I went straight into a band um, I thought I'd do that for a year, become a millionaire, then move on and do medicine or whatever after that. But yeah, it was actually 15 years I did of music because you get involved in things and dragged along. Um, so 15 years of well, a lot of fun. And, and so, what was your first band? It was The Clash. The, so you went straight into The Clash with, because it had already been set up, hadn't it, by, by Joe Strummer and... Well, Jones. it was a fiddly, it was a strange... Um, meandering tale because Bernie Rhodes was trying to get a band off the ground so he started the London SS. I went down there to audition with them and it was Tony James, Brian James, Keith Levine I think was around uh, and a singer called Billy Watts who uh, disappeared fairly early on but so I auditioned for that we sort of talked about it and then I came back to, to re-audition and suddenly um, things had changed. Paul Simon had appeared and um, and we rehearsed again, that seemed pretty good. And I went off and I came back again. I said, we've got a new singer, which is Joe Strummer. I thought, oh, okay. So these are all kind of um, embryonic, you know, uh, tryout bands to find the right blend. So what, what, what I joined- What this, Terry? 76. 76. Yeah. Sorry, go on. So I was only 19 at the time. But um, anyway, we got the band off the ground. It took a long time, we had to rehearse. Bernard had us in a real hot house, rehearsing night and day and all this. And eventually we ready to launch. We went off and did our first few gigs and it, it did well very quickly. Thanks to Bernard, I think, for his planning. And how long did you spend with The Clash before, before you did you that first year or so? Yeah, well, I, I did a year and then somewhere in that year, I decided I wasn't happy. I didn't want to stay with it. So I said, I'm going to leave. And they said, well, can you do the, the next few gigs or whatever it was so we can find someone? Finding someone was a bit tricky. So I actually did the first album in that situation and then a few more gigs and then finally they found Topper who fitted in well so then I moved on and um, let Topper get on with it. Then of course I got a call, call about five years later saying Topper's gone now we need someone else can you come back and I went back and did another year so it's just slightly confusing. But you weren't you weren't uh, just standing still for those five years were you because you've oh, God, been no, no. quite a few bands and played with yeah, quite a I few went from the yeah, when I left The Clash, I, I was with Johnny Thunders for a while. Then I joined uh, Billy Idol and worked with Generation X. Uh, and then when I came back to The Clash, after I left again, well, after it fell apart after that, I joined um, Hanoi Rocks for a while and then uh, Black Sabbath. And that was about it. Then I think, right, I've had enough music now. 15 years is enough and I jumped ship. Was it good fun while it lasted, though? Um, yeah, well, yeah, you have to say it was good fun. But you... It's a bit like when you go on scout camp, you remember all the fun parts and forget all the miserable parts. So it, you look back with thinking it was a lot of fun, but I do remember moaning a lot. <laughs> Everyone moaning. So, uh, but I think, you know, really musicians are spoiled. They have a lovely life. They travel around the world, meet wonderful people. They play gigs and they do what they love and they get paid lots of money for it. So really they're spoiled. And, you know, we knew at the time we were spoiled. We knew we had something better than most people. Think. We knew there were other people working down a coal mine while we were jetting around the world playing music. So we knew we were lucky, but I don't actually express this, but you, we didn't really feel, realise how lucky we were, I think. You know, we were really lucky. 
and the time we did it was the best time to be in a band really when the punk thing took off and it was all new because eventually yeah. the guys um obviously joe strummer sadly is no longer with us but um eventually they all sort of went off and did different things didn't they jo didn't joe become an actor yeah, well, he, I think he saw me talking as a film director, an actor, but he did it. Yeah, he did some stuff in films and a radio show on BBC World Service. So he did all kinds of things, really. He, he would never sit still for long. And Mick was producing lots of bands. I forget which ones off the top of my head, but he, and he had big old uh, Dynamite. And, and Paul has uh, done all sorts of, um, uh, what's the word I'm trying to find? Uh, he got together with various people and did various bits of music. So, yeah, they've all, all done some since. And when it came to the induction, into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. That was you, Paul and Mick, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, well, it was weird because they announced that we were going to be in that new Hall of Fame. So we had a little chat about it. And I said, what does Joe think about this? Because I wouldn't, you never tell with Joe what, how he respond to things like that. And they said, oh, he loves the idea. He's really excited about it. Oh, fair enough. I thought he might be a bit grumpy about it. He was fine about it. Um, and then of course he died before the ceremony. So we went yeah, to the ceremony really in a tough. state of shock. You know, we went in there thinking, bloody hell, you know, we're, we're, we're not quite got digested this, that Joe's gone before we up on a stage and all that. So it was a bit weird. And normally when you get inducted, you play to the assembled audience, you know, a few songs, but we decided not to, because we'd have to draft in another singer, which would be a bit weird. So they just showed videos. And, and it's about the easiest thing I've ever done. Cause you sit there having dinner while people say how wonderful you are. So that's, you know, well, there's, a, there's a lovely picture of you in the book, and I'm going to just hold up the book for everyone mm -hmm. here, The Strange Case of Dr. Terry and Mr. Chimes. Um, and we'll talk about the book a little bit more in a minute. But there's a lovely picture in there of you all on stage getting inducted, and I believe you're next to The Edge, aren't you? Of, um, yeah, you well, The Edge and Tom Morello were the two people who did the induction. Now, they make a speech about you, you know. Um, I asked him afterwards if he's free to do permits and weddings and so on. Speeches, you know. <laughs> and was he? <laughs> yeah, he said, fine, yeah, just let me know. <laughs> Excellent. I'll give him a call. That's that's brilliant. Well, while we're on the, the, the subject of this book, the the title of this book, The Strange Case of Dr. Terry and Mr. Chimes, really came about because your life now is very different, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't think of the right title for the book. And I, I got on a plane to Los Angeles and I got a, a thesaurus, a dictionary, a, a notepad and a pencil. And I thought, I'm not getting off this bloody plane until I've thought of a title for this book. And I got my brain and I squeezed it metaphorically, you know. And about six hours into the flight, the title popped in my head. I thought, oh, The Strange Case of Dr. Terry and Mr. Charles. I that sums it up perfectly. Remember, I actually remember you phoning me up with that light bulb moment. Yeah. So oh, I just went to sleep. I thought, I thought that's it, I've got it. Thank God, I went to sleep for the rest of the trip. But yeah, um, the problem title, is... And, and it does really um, say the massive difference between you as this rock drummer and, uh, and now with, uh, with your chiropractor work. So how did, how did you come to change career? And because it is a vast change of career. Yeah. Well, as I say, when I was a kid, I was always interested in health and disease. I always had this, this yearning and it's a calling really. And people that don't have the calling don't understand it at all. But people that have it will immediately recognize that some people have inside them a sort of a, a, a kind of small voice saying to them, you should be out here healing other people. And that was, it's louder and louder until you just can't ignore it anymore. So um, when I jumped ship, none of the people I was working with were surprised because I was always reading books about health and was interested in that stuff. But the people that were seeing me on the stage, I thought, that's a funny manu that's a funny thing to do. If I'd have joined another band, they thought, oh, okay, that makes sense. But it was a bit surprised for people. But yeah, I just followed my calling and I've been very happy. It's a different thing, obviously. I think it's good to do the music when you're young because you want to go charge around the world, meeting girls and showing off. And when you're a bit older, you want to settle down and be in one place and, and have a life. So, um, and also people don't like a young doctor because they don't know anything. And, and people don't like an old musician because they're kind of out of date. So it all fit together perfectly. And, and now you give, you, your stage appearances now, you give talks on, on this, don't you? Um, yeah, I do a lot of seminars, give talks to people, yeah, about healing and so on. And um, um, yeah, my next challenge actually is I'm going to do a new program, which is, uh, to help people who have that calling, but not sure what, what they should jump or how to do it, to help them on that journey, to give them some inspiration and some encouragement and, uh, and just be helpful to them, really support them on the way. Well, I've, um, I've not only heard you play, but I've also um, 
I, I've also been in front of you when you've been cricking my neck, and I, I know it always um, always feels better after you've done that. So I can I can vouch for you both as a drummer and a chiropractor. But mm. is this something that you can, you enjoy more than the music? Do you, do you or is it just it's a different thing? I, when I stopped music, I said right, stop that, never no going back, and I stopped altogether and didn't do any music for years. Because I thought, I, did, I don't like it when a band that was famous 20 years ago comes and does another gig and, oh, it's just trying to screw every last little drop of money out of what they had. That, that for me is a bit, I was in it in a very special time. It was very exciting and I value that. I don't want to try and recreate it because you can't. So I didn't do any. But then around the time we wrote the book, actually, I think that, as you say, that rekindled my interest in, in music. Yeah, I remember coming to your house because we, we did this, we released this book in 2013. So it's, mm. it's seven years ago, this, this book. Um, but um, uh, I remember coming into your house and there was, apart from a massive great gong, there was nothing there really uh, that said The Clash or percussionist or rock music or, or anything. It was, it, it, you seem to have turned away from, from that. And as, as you've just said, I remember as well that when we started to do the book um your interest started to come back there was a few more things around your house that that yeah reminded everybody of um of your previous life so do most people not have a massive gong in their hall then um there's there's very few people that i know that have a massive gong um i do know one person that has more than one and that's now also you yeah <laughs> you've got to have a few gongs around it's a lovely sound <laughs> but what happened was uh while we were doing that i got invited to the launch of a book i thought oh well, i'm writing a book so that'd be good to go to the launch and it was a book about oddball musicians which i was one so i flew over to um stockholm for the launch and they said to me um uh if you could stand up and say a few words i said that's fine i said and if you could play a couple of songs i said okay i'll do that i said when did you last play i said about 20 years ago I said, well, can you still do it? I said, yeah, it's like riding a bike. So they, they said, okay. And when they put me out from the airport, they said, uh, we, we have to think about this. We don't think you can do this because 20 years is too long. I said, I can assure you, it won't be a problem. So we got there and we got there late because the flight was delayed or something. And I got there, so there was no time for rehearsal or anything. They were on the stage. I jump up on the stage and play two songs. And uh, it was fine because the muscle memory is still there. So I just did what I used to do. But when I finished those two two-minute songs, my arms were like dropping off. So muscles weren't used to it, but we got away with it. And then that was um, Mick Gigas, Gigas from uh, Cockney Rejects and um, uh, Dave from uh, Sham 69. That's Dave Kudo, 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 Kudo. 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 So we got together and just formed a band out of that. And uh, we made, it, made two albums so far. We were going to do some more gigs actually before the lockdown, but we had to cancel them. And that's, um, it's called The Crunch. Yeah. It's a, a nice mixture of The Clash and what you do now. I think that's well known. Yeah. <laughs> as well and uh and the lead singer is um sulo carlson from yeah. uh, a band called diamond dogs back in the yeah, day well, well sulo is a, a, a strange human being he writes a song every 10 minutes so he's with all kinds of things he does all he's swedish and he does he's in all kinds of swedish stuff theater productions and stuff write stuff all the time so yeah he's an uh, interesting character he's a singer and we've got the other two as i said is there going to be a third album uh, we've just to... recorded some uh, a few songs for like an EP, or I don't suppose you call them EPs anymore, but like, like three or four songs. So that that will come. That's coming out now, I think. Yeah, excellent. And um, just so that everyone knows, because we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to put links. We always put links um, up with these interviews so that people can buy the book and come and see your concerts and buy the albums, etc. Um, so um, so what what um, what kind of of music is this third album because I, I know that the, the first two albums are going to be very similar to the to the music that uh, of the fans that you already have so so yeah it's I think you'll see it on uh, YouTube a few videos get an idea uh, the way that if you want if, if you want the book or the CD or anything uh, is terrychimes.com just get on there and it's all on there okay and you yeah because you've got a you've got a website with um so norm, normally when we're when we're selling the book and we're selling anything, uh, we point them towards Amazon. But uh, but with you, it's probably best to point them point them towards your website because you can send these you can send everything out yourself. 
Yeah, and I can sign the book. If people want to sign, they, I can sign it for them. They just say in, a, in an email, yeah. That's, uh, that's excellent. So when, when we first started, uh, you said you were in lockdown with your family, and I know you're a great family man, so, so tell us a little bit more about your family. I've been married six years, and we've got a five-year-old boy and a one-year-old girl, and a dog, and my mum in an annex next door. So we've, uh, <laughs> it's pretty lively here. <laughs> so lockdown wasn't really like why people just sitting and doing nothing. We were still doing loads of things because you, as a family, you do. But it's been good because when you're working hard, you don't see as much as your family as you'd like. So this is a nice little, you know, window to do that. And is there is is there much percussion stuff around? Have you been doing much drumming well, in lockdown, or is yeah during the lockdown we I built a log cabin in the garden. And I'm getting it soundproof so I can smash don't. the hell out of the drums and no one can hear me. So that'd be quite good. So, yeah, my little boy might have a go on the drums. We'll see. I was going to say that is, um, would, you want your, would you want your children to become musicians? Ooh, I don't know. I think we had the best time. And now it's harder to make money out of music. You know, it's, it's a tough life. So I think I prefer to say, well, I don't know. I think the important thing is that they do what they want to do. It reminds me of the old Jewish joke, two Jewish grand grandmothers talking. One says to the other, how old are your grandchildren now? I said, well, the accountant's four and the dentist is six. Okay, I don't think you should <laughs> make your mark too early what they're going to be, let them be what they want. Yeah, I think I upset my parents in that regard, so I'm doing this. Um, so once lockdown is over, do, so uh, does all your... Um, chiropractor work just go back as it, it was. Yeah, I've started you... already actually. Yeah, I have to wear, I have to look like Darth Vader with a like a you know, a, a what do you call it, a visor and a mask and gloves and all sorts. Excellent, but... there's my there's my new screensaver right there. Um, yeah, yeah. so, um, what do you think you've learned during lockdown, both personally and professionally? Has it, um, has it taught you anything? Well, it's taught me that. Uh, I miss seeing my patients. I miss them. They're like friends. So I, I, it's made me appreciate how great my job is, how much I like it. And it's also made me realise how fragile uh, our society is. It can just crash at any moment for any, all sorts of things. So, um, and also, I've learned that when you don't have to do anything, you don't get much done. You know, in lockdown, you, I, I thought, right, I've got 12 weeks here. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. I've only done half. I've read half the books I intended to read because you just don't get things done as quickly. You go into a slower pace like you do on the holiday. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a strange time for, for everyone. And, um, and I'm guessing, because you, your business is now from home anyway, isn't it? Yeah. So like, like me, you know, we both work from, from home. Um, so maybe less has changed for us than, than some other people. I know that mm -hmm. a lot of the publishers that I deal with, um, their offices aren't opening until September. Mm -hmm. um, there's a photographic agency that I deal very closely with and they're not opening up their building until next year. So I wow. think it's, it's very, very different for, um, for different mm -hmm. people. In this, oh, and, yeah. um, in it's, it's going to take time for. I don't think anything's going to be completely normal again. Mm -hmm. There will be yeah. a new normal, but it, it's nice to see some things getting back. As, as lockdown has, has eased, have you been getting out much? Oh, I, I walk the dog three times a day in the forest. So I'm doing that all the way through. So that, that again, that hasn't changed. I do that all the time. So yeah. that's brilliant, Terry. Um, this has been an excellent interview uh, i've loved talking to you because um i know that you have been equally passionate um about both of your careers and i am very pleased that that when we worked on the book that it rekindled your interest for the music as well mm -hmm. because uh, i know you're still a fantastic drummer so uh, terry chimes uh thank you very much for this Stay safe and my love to the family. Take care.